Hey guys, it's going to be a very, very busy day. I've got a lot to do, so I'm going to get straight into it. The most important thing you can do when you've got a lot of work is split it down into several sections as a to-do list. The first two go together. So I've written them together, but uh, I will be taking one after the other rather than all at once because that would just be a mess. Some of you may have noticed that I started putting the vlogs up during the middle of the day instead of late at night, and that's because I started editing them on a morning. It just makes it better from my point of view because I'm less tired when I'm editing, which makes the edits better. Editing Jen's video then follows, and it's pretty much the same as editing the vlog, only it's with Jen. Despite what the Bolton News claimed on Facebook last night, tonight is the council meeting, so I've got to redraft my speeches for that. I want to make them as good as I can. I've already got them written, but I want to make sure that they're even better. And that's it. Five different things to do today, which splits up my day, and it actually works out quite well because after this, I think I'm going to be able to do everything. It's important to have everything broken down into tasks that you can complete rather than just think, oh, I've got so much to do today, and then never get it done because you're overwhelmed. I actually have an application on my phone that I could use to do all of this, but I always find that writing them down has an extra something that really helps to organise myself in my head. I don't know where it is. It works for me. might work for you. Right, let's get to work. Right, I've just uh, ticked these two off. I did try and record me ticking them off to make it uh, fit part of the vlog, but I just decided not to record. So that's kind of how my day is going. And now it's 20 past three, as you can see on the clock. I'm currently uh, processing out Jen's video. All of these files here are what I used to make Jen's video, and all of them had to be imported again after I'd already imported them because it decided that it couldn't find the files and then they were, might be corrupt. So I had to do it again. And now an hour later than I wanted to be, I'm starting to get a bit annoyed and a bit stressed. So I better get down to the town hall once this is finished processing, which means Jen's video is going up tonight because I haven't got time to watch it through to make sure it's all right. So that's just how it's going to have to be. You know, all the stress that uh, I was having earlier on, but it pales into insignificance when I see just how beautiful the place gets to work is. I have to admit, I do feel immensely honoured. <laughs> and it happens every time I come down here. That building is wonderful. Oh, it's fantastic. Let's get to work. Well, I got to work and naturally when I have to print my speech, the printer has decided that there's a paper problem, but there is no paper problem as far as I can see, so wonderful. It's not one problem, it's another. It's going to be one of those days. World AIDS Day takes place this Friday, the 1st of December. It's a day of awareness raising, but it's also a day of unity with more than 100,000 people in the UK who live with HIV and AIDS. That may seem like a staggering number of people, but sadly the number is growing each year. On average, 6,000 people in this country are diagnosed with HIV each year. Most contracted because they either don't know the risk they're taking or because they don't believe that they can catch it from the risky activities that they take part in. According to a recent CDC report, HIV rates are increasing at the most amongst gay and bisexual men between the ages of 25 and 44. These are men who should know the risks because they were born either before and therefore grew up in or born after the AIDS crisis of the 80s. It is therefore essential that initiatives such as World AIDS Day are supported and that their message gets out to at-risk communities. I therefore ask the Leader of the Council this question. Will he join me and my fellow Conservatives in supporting the World AIDS Day and urge everyone in the at-risk groups to not only take the necessary precautions, but also to get themselves checked for, on a regular basis for HIV? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, this matter has been debated around the world over the last couple of weeks. When I wrote the motion, child-targeted gambling was something only gamers and private eye were angry about. But as we all know, politics moves quickly. Hawaii has now declared one loose box-oriented game to be a trap and an online casino designed to lure kids into spending money. Meanwhile, the Belgian Gaming Commission is meeting to determine whether loose boxes are a form of gambling, and I've heard Australia, Sweden and other countries are now looking into these predatory systems. In the UK, one other council has discussed loot boxes, although I will point out that they did this independently of this motion. This is not part of some coordinated campaign. It's a case of a lot of people becoming very concerned about a very troubling matter independently of one another. I know that several members have been asking what a loot box is, so I'll sum it up quickly. It's a virtual scratch card. It's a fruit machine. You either buy a loot box or, as is more common, and in my view, and far more predatory, the game will simply give you a loot box, but then you have to buy a key to open it. 
When the box is opened, the key disappears and you receive some virtual items. Sometimes these are useful, but oftentimes they're not. The useful and most desired items are purposefully made rare to encourage players to keep buying them in order to finally get the item that they want. But the Gambling Commission does not classify them as gambling. They think these items don't have any real-world value. They're wrong. Counter-Strike Global Offensive has new patterns and colour schemes for its knives and guns as its loot box prizes. These can be traded or sold on online marketplaces. They can be gambled with in online casinos set up solely to use them like casino chips. The new Call of Duty game set in World War II showed us the latest way that games are enticing kids to gamble. They created a social experience around loot boxes, which are opened in public, and players are encouraged to watch each other do it. This is peer pressure selling, and it's on Normandy Beach during D-Day because these predators have no shame whatsoever. But it's not the only form of peer pressure enticement. Game publisher Activision patented a method to use its players to exert peer pressure on one another. Players' styles and preferences are analysed in order to determine which items they are more likely to be susceptible to purchasing. And then they're pitted against other players who have already bought that item, with the idea being that once they see the item in question being used, they're more likely to buy it. Children are especially vulnerable to these forms of peer pressure. But again, it's not the only method being used to lure kids in. There are online casinos with child-themed bingo and fruit machine games too. There really is no end to the underhanded tactics that these companies are willing to employ in order to take as much money from vulnerable people as possible. Mr. Mayor, these are all predatory mechanisms that play on children and vulnerable adults. People's lives have been ruined by these things. Children spend thousands of pounds of their parents' money, sometimes without their parents' permission, and adults who are susceptible to this form of enticement have ruined their finances. It's not unknown to see accounts of children racking up bills of £3,000 or more, and in one case I've seen, an American gamer spent $16,000 on youth loot boxes. The gaming industry called this kind of person a whale and actively seek them out. It's predatory behaviour at its most extreme. And it's not just online either. I know several of my colleagues on this side of the chamber have information on how casinos and other establishments have made it not only easy but desirable for children to play on their machines. This is absolutely unforgivable. To that end, I therefore ask this council to call on the Gambling Commission to reassess their stance on loot boxes and other forms of gambling by proxy and pledge to increase the vigour with which we express our duty as corporate parents to prevent the further spread of gambling in our town that is aimed at children and vulnerable adults. Thank you. The council meeting went on longer than I expected and it went well. The motion that put forward, it was uh, passed and hopefully this will put pressure on the Gambling Commission to relook at loot boxes and other forms of child-targeted gambling. We have a big problem, especially online gambling. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Child-targeted bingo machines on websites? Come on. And loot boxes where you can't progress in your game properly unless you're paying? No, come on. These things have got to change. So I'm going to keep on top of that and uh, make sure something happens. I want to, I want to do something good with this and make sure it makes a difference but it's been a long day it's a good victory but i'm exhausted now so i'm going to bed see you tomorrow today's video is brought to you by my graphic novels the collected life of nocty mouse volume one all over the house volume one and all over the house volume two thank you